Again, as I promised, I'll give you some African examples. So an example of a passive margin is the bread, well, I said here bread is door basin, but it's the bread is door basin is actually a sub-basin, and the big, big main basin is the Otaniqua basin. So let's look at a map here. In yellow here, you've got the Cape Fold Belt, so we're moving across the coast here. Um, it doesn't list any of the towns, but Cape Town is further to the west. As you go towards the east, I'm sure East London and PE are somewhere here. Um, so that yellow is the Cape Supergroup and the Cape Fold Belt. Blue is the Karoo Supergroup. And so we've moved offshore here, and here this whole area is called the Otaniqua Basin. And it is sub subdivided into multiple sub-basins. So here's the Breadersdorp sub-basin, Pletmos, Chamtuas, and Algoa basins. And you might have heard here of the southern Otaniqua Basin, and this is where Total has just drilled and found gas. I think they drilled in 2018, and they're now they're trying to drill again. And you can see between all these sub-basins are these arches, and there's also a hang of a lot of northwest to southeast folding. I mean faults. And another interesting thing to note here is this fracture zone that goes from the northeast to the southwest. This is called the Agullis Falklands Fracture Zone. And this formed because the Falkland Islands were actually up here and they sheared off, they moved all the way down here during the breakup of Gondwana and they're now down towards South America. So that's why the word Falklands is here. Um, this is a very busy slide. But this here is a diagram from a scientific paper of the deposits we find in the Breedersdorp Basin. So just to go back here, Breedersdorp was the most studied of the basins because it's obviously closest to shore, it's closest to Cape Town, probably where all the knowledge was. And they do actually have a producing gas field and it feeds over here to the Mossel Bay um, gas plant. It's called Moss Gas although I think they're running out of gas, so they really want to find more stuff, more gas here to feed into the plant. So the Breedersdorp Basin is quite well studied, and that's why we'll focus on it here. Quite a few seismic lines and wells drilled. So you can see on the left-hand side here is age. So we're dealing, I think, tertiary down to Jurassic, and we care, at, I mean, everything started down here because this is when Gondwana started to break apart. And the main things I wanted to show you is it, it lists here depositional environments. So we went from the bottom here, it was fluvial and lacustrine, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's uh, rivers and lakes. Then it changed to be shallow marine to continental. Then we moved into deep marine and then more modern times, around 100 million years ago, regressive cycles in response to eust eustatic and tectonic influences. It just means sea level is coming, going up and down, up and down. You can see that's why there's all this zigzag pattern here. And all of these different environments were due to different tectonic activity, and that's what you can see in this column. So at the bottom here is initial rifting. This is when Gondwana was breaking apart. Major regional uplift initial opening of marine flooding of basin. So, I mean, uh, you can see we're down to 126 here. So, down here we've got the rifting associated with the initial breakup of Gondwana. And then as we're moving up here, you're starting to get your Agullis fracture zone. So, the, uh, that northwest to south, northeast to southwest fracture zone, you're getting the Falklands Island moving along that fracture zone and uh, causing different tectonism. So here, thermal subsidence, eustatic effects, uplift and erosion. Thermal subsidence, final separation from Falklands, so it's moving off over here, last major uplift. And so that's what's caused all these different deposits. And if you spend some time, you could look at what all the different colors mean. Blue means that we've got mainly deep marine down here, and then we're moving up here into coastal regions. Um, well, green is alluvial, pink down here is fluvial, and this orange, yellow, and light green, I don't see too much light green, maybe down there, this orange and yellow is mainly coastal, and then you're moving up onto um, alluvial stuff up here. So we're going from deep marine, and deep marine is where we're going to find our reservoirs. So on the side, sorry, not our reservoirs, our source rock. So on the side here it talks about the different source rocks, but it's our, the main source rock here is from the Aptian mudstone. So over here, 
we've got about 100 million years ago a good mud rock from the deep marine environment that's acting as a source and then over here in this column it shows us several reservoirs different yellow um, sandstones so the mud rock here produced gas the gas escaped along um, different pathways or along fracked faults and moved into these reservoirs that had seals and they became trapped in there um, and that's what resulted in this next column which says gas and oil shows so um, dark circles are oil and a, a light circle is gas so this shows us that the Bredesdorp Basin has both oil and gas and the traps the things that kept the oil and gas trapped were different things in the uh, deeper down here you've got structural domes that trap the oil and gas here you've got turbidite fan channel and fan sandstone so this is more um, what's it called sedimentary traps and then up here fault bounded drape stratigraphic so this is a combination of structural and stratigraphic traps so that was a very quick run through of the Bredesdorp Basin um, I just wanted to give you some images here so you can see up top here this is the breakup of Gondwana not at 180 million years it's a bit earlier this is when this big chunk of land or, or sorry this continent maybe or crust is I suppose it's actually lithosphere if it's plate tectonics is shearing past South Africa here you can see the direction of the arrows here as South America also moves off to the southwest and that's what's causing these rift basins um, and so you can see here this is some seismic interpreted seismic data from the Bredesdorp Basin purple is your basement orange is the rift sediments and then you're starting to get into this they call it drift sediments on top and there's lots of uh, normal faults um, lower down here that often act as pathways for the gas and oil to escape so you can see normal faulting north of the gullus fracture zone so up here um, within the Otanikwa Basin, creation of graben and half graben structures, which is all important for hosting the oil and gas. And again, yeah, these are just pictures for you to see that um, these normal faults in the basement have created pathways for gas to migrate, and they also can create traps. So let's look here. In green here is a poten potential reservoir. So you can see it's sealed off on this left side by the fault. Um, it's in a sandstone body up so this is a, a structural trap up here in these sandstones it seems more um, stratigraphic traps uh, trapping the the oil and also on the right hand side here you've got a lot of structural traps so these are just two different profiles through the basin um, and on the left hand side here it shows you where these different profiles are and I think in pink I'm just trying to look no, okay. Um, I haven't looked in detail at this map. Okay, and then lastly, to finish off, sorry, this lecture is becoming longer than I expected. Let's quickly look at the foreland basin, which is the Karoo, and this is where there was more gas. This is an image of the Karoo that I think we're all quite comfortable with, and this is Lesotho over here in, with the lavas, Jobig is on the right, George is on the left here, so it's a north south profile through South Africa and you've got this basin deepening towards the south and these wiggly lines here are the Cape Fold Belt. And we all see this image and we think, oh my word, the Karoo is so deep. But in all honesty, it's only like five kilometers deep. So this image is heavily vertically exaggerated. It is very stretched. And this is actually in the bottom here what this image should look like. It should probably be even more squashed. So the Karoo is really a thin part of our geological covering. Um, so it's just these images are very stretched, so please keep that in mind. And this is just an image from a paper that I did with Sue and Musa in this, uh, the school. So here's the outline of South Africa, and in color here are the Karoo rocks. So they really cover a huge part of South Africa. And you might have heard the fact that it's been of interest for shale gas, and the layer that's of interest for shale gas is the White Hill Formation. And you can see in black here, this is where it outcrops on the side. It's actually thought to pinch out here between Herzogville and Coffee Bay. So it's only in the southern part of the basin. It gets deeper towards the south. 
And so initially, they estimated that we would have 450 TCF of gas in the basin because they took this area and they calculated how much gas would be in it and they thought, oh my word, we're going to have one of the biggest shale gas deposits in the world. But then they realized, well actually, you're not going to find shale gas at all these locations because your shale layer has to be at the right depth to produce gas, which is really only a smaller part in the south here. Then they realized, oh my word, all these purple light wiggles here are dolerites, Karoo dolerites, and they're going to heat up the shale layer and the gas is going to escape. So we need to take that into account. And there's a hang of a lot of dolerites in the west and a hang of a lot in the east. So there's actually only a small part in the middle here that might produce shale gas. So the original values of 250, 450 TCF went down to 20 TCF. Um, and just so that you know, in red here, these are hydrothermal vents. So actually, uh, explosive vents linked to the dolerites coming in contact with the shales. That also will have helped the gas escape. Uh, all these triangles are cities. This black line is actually a seismic line in the area that we looked at. Um, so as I just mentioned, when they eventually took into account the dolerites, their estimates of the amount of gas decreased significantly. And that's what we can see in this diagram here. These triangles are all boreholes drilled through the Karoo. And in red, there's more than 500 meters of dolerite in the borehole. Orange is 150 to 500 meters. Green is less than 500 meters. So you can see in the middle here, there's much less dolerite. And blue, there's no dolerite. Because at some point in the south here, there's absolutely no dolerites because they don't go further south, we think, due to the Cape Fold Belt. So this central region here really is the ideal place to look for the shale gas. And this is a cross-section from west to east here, looking at these boreholes. And you can see on the west and on the east, these dashed lines are all the dolerites. And so they threw out the stratigraphic column. Um, so it's not going to be ideal to frack in these regions. But in the center here, where the green boreholes are, all the dolerites are within the Beaufort, whereas our shales are down here. So they won't have been vastly affected by the dolerites. So in conclusion, I really just wanted to say that you, it's important to know about tectonics so that you can, when you're working for companies, you can help interpret a region and, and better understand what deposits could be there. And we've said that oil and gas deposits or plays are mainly associated with passive margins and foreland basins. Um, and so you then will be an asset to your company because you will be able to just better interpret the tectonics and help them more easily find these deposits.